Thank you all for seeing this film. I always feel when I watch a film like Open Heart that um, it's um, really impactful because it makes us really think about, and I'll introduce all of our uh, panelists um, in a moment, it, it really kind of forces us to confront, you know, what we don't think about in our lives, and that's what really good films do. They are the beginning stepping stones to places often we haven't been, and then they provoke us to ask why. Why is rheumatic heart disease still so uh, rampant in Africa? And they ask us how, how can we help, what can we do? But we have to have the film, we have to have the story first before we can do anything. And that's why I love films in particular because they're, they're so impactful and they so connect us to the real issues. So we're going to discuss uh, this film and how it got made and then we're going to have two other panelists talk about the work they do and how it kind of relates to what's going on in Sudan. And so first, you know, what compelled me about this <coughs> film is the statistic at the beginning that said that there are 13 million children in Africa suffering from rheumatic heart disease, which is completely curable. I'm a pediatrician as well, uh, with penicillin. It prevents it. And it's really, it's an autoimmune disease that strikes kids because they build antibodies to the strep, which is very common, and then attacks uh, their heart, mostly their, their valves. And completely preventable if the child had access to clinical care and to penicillin. So, uh, when, I, when you hear that statistic, 13 million children, what do you think? Probably nothing, because it's very hard for us to conceive of what 13 million means. It's just, it's a number that, you know, doesn't come easily to our brains. But when you see a film like Open Heart, which is about a small number of children, particularly Angelique and Marie, then it brings home the reality of that number. Then the numbers are useful. Give us, they give us a context for what the problem is. But when we see the story first, the story of Marie and the story of Marie's father and the care that he had for her and the fear that he had and the trust that he had, um, that puts into perspective what's going on. And so we need those stories profoundly and first before we get the numbers, I think, because the numbers themselves really don't have impact, and there's research on that, and if you come to our panel tomorrow, we'll talk more about why stories are, are important and data come <laughs> later. But I think that you see that, <laughs> I think you see that in this film, because um, you will never forget now what it means for a child to have a preventable disease like rheumatic uh, heart disease, and what it takes to to manage that child's health, what it takes to cure that child and what those children have to go through for something that's completely preventable. And then that story in itself, I hope ignites something in you to find out more, go someplace to find out more, make a donation to the center or whatever it is that you, whatever actionable step you can take, that's what is so profound about a film like this. Um, and just to be informed, often we may think is enough but is it? So that's another question that this raises. Now what, you know, we can't do everything about everything, but if, you, if this film struck you, I'm sure that you will then kind of go and do more, and that's the power of filmmaking. So I'm going to first introduce, uh, I'm going to introduce all three of our panelists, and then I'm going to ask them some questions, and I'm going to sort of probe what, you know, how their own lives connect. Well, one person's life, Corey Stern's life, connects directly because Corey's the producer of this film. And Corey is a, a well-known filmmaker who does feature films in, in Hollywood so that she can do her passions, which are films like Open Heart. And Corey works with um, Partners in Health, led by Paul Farmer at Harvard Medical School, and was involved from the very start in making this film. And this film came out of an actually a bigger film, a, long, a, a, full, a feature length documentary that is still being made. And this story in, in itself was so profound and could be separated from the other film. And so um, that's how it got made. And, and as you probably know, it was nominated for an Oscar, um, not last year, but the year before. So it really had an impact on on uh, Hollywood in a very profound way. And Corey continues to do this kind of work. And then next to Corey is Ola. And Ola is a um, uh, Nigerian emergency physician. And her story is one of growing up in England in a foster family with a multicultural family and 
seeing the world through that lens. And early on in her childhood, wanting to be a physician, seeing um, the world through sort of this multicultural family that she, she grew up in. And when she was older, her sister was um, uh, in Nigeria, right, Nigeria, and became quite ill. And unfortunately, in Africa, there's only one air ambulance company, and that was in South Africa. And Nigeria is thousands of miles away. So in order to set up this air ambulance to get her sister to treatment, it took several days, and by the time the ambulance was available, her sister had passed away. So Ola became an emergency physician and the founder of uh, an air ambulance um, company that now uh, takes patients across Western and Central Africa, and it's the first of its kind, and she's a helicopter pilot as well. So she will talk about um, some similarities to about access and what, what, and what the problems are. But what's profound about Ola's story is that it's very, it's very similar to um, many stories of doctors that you saw those wonderful quotes at the beginning. We often, we often go through stories ourselves that change our lives and direct us to become physicians or to become whatever career that we, we decide to embark on. And so for Ola, it was this profound experience that led her to do these amazing things and to be so accomplished in her field. And then um, Neo is also a physician, Tepla, a Tapla, and Neo has a very similar story. Neo is from Botswana, and she grew up um, in a country that has no cancer treatment when you were growing up, correct? And her, her dear aunt who took care of her died at age 41 of breast cancer. And there was no treatment. And she also had many family members who had HIV and AIDS, which was, um, which struck Botswana uh, profoundly. So she grew up in the same, in a similar kind of story of one of the need for health care and access to health care. And it struck her deeply, so much so that when she, she came to the United States after her, her aunt passed away, she went to high school here and she ultimately went to Harvard Medical School, trained, and then went back to Botswana as an internist and um, now working at Partners in Health where she does work in um, non-communicable disease, particularly breast cancer, cervical cancer in women, diabetes, um, and uh, heart failure. So we hear so much and importantly about infectious disease, but non-communicable disease is also a big problem <coughs> in Africa, and in my opinion, should not be one or the other, and I think there'll be some discussions tomorrow. There's some very renowned people who talk about that, but why must we divide it into one or the other? And that's the question that, you know, our own stories raise and these films raise. So these, so these two um, multi-talented physicians uh, come from um, lives of compelling stories. And so they'll both speak to how this film kind of sparks um, their interest in doing something beyond what um, most of us set out to do. So first, I'm going to start with, with Corey and just find out, you know, I was talking about Ola's story and Neo's story, but you must have a story too about why this film, like did you just decide you're going to make a film about rheumatic heart disease? What's, what's behind this? Well, I, I, as you said, I thank you, Neil, so much. And thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm so grateful to Peggy Clark and the whole team here. Um, this, I was, I am making a film, as you know, and have been for a while, about uh, partners in health and global health equity and from Alma Ata to Rwanda, this incredible story of the global health equity movement. And we were following a patient story, uh, Angelique, and it became its own thing. And we pulled it out of the main film and turned it into a short because it really felt like it deserved that story. It, it's its own platform. But for me, I have a very personal connection uh, to the issue of rheumatic heart disease. It was, uh, I was uh, a refugee from the American television industry as you can appreciate, and um, I wanted to take a break from the insanity of that, so I went to Nigeria, and I was in northern, or north central Nigeria, central plateau state, um, and I was applying my producerial skills to, uh, to relief work, 
in, uh, in Nigeria in the early 2000s. And I was working in a hospital and I was just coordinating getting in supplies and different things. And I met a little boy named Amiru who basically when he came into the hospital, he was in cardiac arrest. And um, he had mitral valve disease, he had valvular disease. And I talked to his doctor and she explained to me what rheumatic heart disease was and I was shocked. I was like, wait a minute, from strep throat and what can be done? And she's like, he, he needs an operation and it's not available here in Nigeria. And that was shocking to me. And, and um, she asked me if I could help and I didn't know what to do. And, and I came back to the US and tried to get surgery donated and couldn't get it. And um, before I could secure anything, he passed away. And um, I called the doctor and she said, well, there's another kid, could you keep trying? And so I did and I, I was able to secure free surgery for a little girl named Ruth, who on her 12th birthday flew from Lagos to Maine for heart surgery at um, Barbara Bush Children's Hospital. And it seemed insane to me that, you know, we're it, it just the, the idea that there's like, strep throat and then it leads to a kid needing to get on an airplane and fly to Maine because the surgery isn't available in their country and and um, I, I've worked with different organizations trying to help get cardiac hospitals started in, in different countries Nigeria primarily but I continued to get kids you know probably 150 to 200 kids over the last 10 years now surgery and it's you know, the starfish thing, it matters a lot to that one, and it does, but the idea that we need, you know, that we need systems of care for everyone in their, in their homes, in their home countries, is something really important to me. So when we were following the story of Angelique, I've never merged the work that I've done in getting kids healthcare with my film, with film work at all. It just happened to be that this patient needed um, needed valve surgery and we were able to capture the story of these eight kids so that's where it came from so it was really I feel like seeing Angelique is a tribute to Amiru and Amiru's mother too I mean the parents in this story are real heroes to me so I do feel like that if um, the the results of the film have been profound in that we've, we've one, um, Bashir agreed to give the $5 million after we got the Oscar nomination. So, <laughs> yay, <laughs> the red carpet did something. And, um, and then additionally, there, there's been a lot of impact from this little film. Uh, the, the government of Rwanda, they're already amazing. The health minister of Rwanda, I'm so sad she wasn't able to be here, but she's, she's so incredible. Uh, you know, they, they're already working on NCDs and, you know, so many areas. But because of the film, Skoll Foundation stepped in. They gave an unprecedented uh, grant directly to the government of Rwanda, which is a really smart way to do it. It's going to be a great use of funds to dramatically reduce rheumatic heart disease. Um, I think it's 80% by 2020 or 2025. Um, it, and, and it's going to provide, I mean, you can speak more to what exactly that grant's going for, but that's directly as a result of, of Open Heart. So for me, it is a very personal story. Thank you. It's a very, it's a very like, to think of Amiru and to know that this is a result of, you know, my part in it and obviously a lot of work by a lot of people. Thank you. Well, Thanks. you know, your story, the story of the little boy really <laughs> ignited you, and that's such the power of storytelling and films. And you've just given us examples of how the, the film itself ignited the Skoll Foundation and the president of Sudan and, and others to, to pitch in to do that. And that's, that's what's so incredible about the story because it moves us in a way, you know, our, our brains are wired to tell stories, I think. And the emotional really does have an impact and it gets people going. And, um, it's it's really it's really a wonderful tribute to this little boy that all these that and this film actually honors him I think in that way that um, these other children were saved. So um, Ola, tell us how this film affected you when you saw it and how it it parallels issues in your life 
in terms of dealing with um, the work you do in Nigeria? Are there parallels? Um, I think the most striking parallel for me um, that I saw was the issue of the cost of healthcare. And anybody who was at my last talk, I've already um, addressed the co uh, cost of healthcare. Um, the amount that was needed to run the hospital for this year um, that they were asking for was $5 million. Um, by the next year, it will be $7 million. By the next year after that, it will be $10 million. Um, and the reason for that is because our market in healthcare actually doesn't follow the laws of demand and supply at all. So we have the iPhone law in healthcare for medical devices where they make a very, very minor adjustment in whatever equipment that they're selling, and then the price increases exponentially. And I'd like to see um, innovation in the cost of healthcare in that we can actually bring the cost of doing these operations, bring down the, um, down, bring down the cost of medical devices, bring down the cost of um, pharmaceuticals, because um, the costs, I think, of global healthcare are spiraling, spiraling out of control, not just within Africa, but across the globe. And I think that what the film highlighted to me most of all is that we need to have a sustainable solutions to our healthcare problems, not just in Africa, but across the globe. We need to bring down the cost of healthcare, bring down the cost of medical devices, bring down the cost of medical services, maybe even decrease the length of medical training or substitute doctors for other professionals in some areas so we can really, really meet the people that need healthcare services at the point of their need in a sustainable um, fashion that governments will be able to cope with. Um, in Africa, we deal with massive populations, especially in Nigeria. We're going to have 200 million people in Nigeria by 2025. How are we going to afford to provide healthcare for all of these people on, with the other issues that we're dealing with, security, infrastructure, etc. cetera. It's, it's, it's going to be difficult if we don't start thinking about how we can bring down the cost of healthcare. Well, Ola, you bring up this issue of cost, which is really related to prevention. So um, we saw that these kids suffer from a very preventable <coughs> disease, and, and penicillin is extraordinarily cheap. cheap. Um, and yet, it's just not available, and there are barriers. We even look to our own country, and I, I live in Los Angeles, and one out of nine Angelinos has type 2 diabetes, a preventable disease caused by obesity, which will cost the county of Los Angeles, well, already cost the county, it's billions and billions of dollars. So it's, it's a, it is a global problem, uh, really, about preventable diseases that are costing us so much money. So none of these children really should, should be facing this. And no children in the United States fortunately face this because when a child has strep, they usually get pretty sick and they, get, they don't get penicillin. Well, they still get penicillin in the United States, but they might get augmentin or something else that's more expensive. But they get treated. Um, just like children in the United States do not get HIV because their mothers are tested uh, uh, before they give birth pretty much uh, universally now. So we don't see it in the United States like I did when I was in training even in the 90s. So there's good prevention, but still not enough, which costs us profound amounts of money. And so this is a striking issue that really goes to, I guess, political will and mm -hmm. social will. Um, can you speak a little bit more, though, about um, that the point you made was sort of more a global point, now a personal point, and what you found in Nigeria that, you know, caused you to do what you were doing, and what have you been able to prevent or do now with what you have, can you tell everyone what, what you know, I gave them a little clue about how you founded this, this organization because of your own story, but tell us more about now how it's grown, what it does, what you provide. Um, I think that when we speak about epidemics in Africa, uh, most people think about HIV, um, think about TB, um, and think about malaria. Um, but in Africa today, um, I think one of the most devastating epidemics is actually a, a epidemic of trauma, where people, um, because of a number of factors, including poor road infrastructure, huge distances between um, tertiary centers, and um, lack of access, 
actually 50% of our patients in Nigeria are not reaching hospital. Um, and Nigeria is a vast country. Um, a, lot of, a lot of Nigeria is not linked um, appropriately by road. Some of the journeys that we're covering by air would take several days by boats, a combination of boats and road to meet even a smaller hospital. So what we've managed to do at the Flying Doctors is bridge the gaps for these people and our aim is to get every single person to the right facility within the right um, time frame. Now, um, our business model, because it, it's a private company, um, is um, quite interesting. We leverage on our relationships with the oil and gas industry for offshore evacuation, and we use that to supplement the money that we get from the government to provide um, services for um, road traffic accident victims, victims of disasters, etc. So um, that's our business model, and I'm, I'm very proud of what we've been able to achieve because it is sustainable. We don't receive any money from any international donors. This is created by Africans for Africans, and um, I think that this is the way that Africa needs to look to evolve because I believe that um, pre-financial crisis, um, we had access to a lot of funds from the Western world, but now we're discovering that actually America and Europe are actually facing their own healthcare crisis. Um, we're looking at a, world, a global healthcare crisis where the costs are, like I said, spiraling out of control for everybody. And I think that Africa is perfectly positioned to not only solve our own healthcare problems, but actually maybe even start exporting healthcare solutions to the West. Um, we are in a very, very good position to um, experiment with cheaper materials. We have shorter time to market, um, time to market um, times because of um, the lack of regulation. Um, we don't actually, we can bring devices, medical devices and medical products to the market a lot quicker than you would do in the West. And we also have like a huge mobile phone penetration in Africa, a lot of techies, a lot of programmers. And I think that um, the African young people are actually poised um, not just to bring healthcare solutions to Africa, but actually healthcare solutions to the world. And it's already happening. Um, my Oxylog ventilator, which sits on the air ambulance, um, costs about $35,000. Um, and this cannot, it's not, no, no, it's not going to be the ventilator for every hospital in Nigeria. It's not going to work, it's too expensive. Um, and it would, um, every patient on a ventilator, it would increase the price for every patient on a ventilator. So um, to look in, um, looking into our rural hospitals, we decided to look at alternative products that did the same thing for less cost. And we discovered um, a ventilator, I think out of India, um, that costs $80, does exactly the same thing as the Oxylog, and is disposable. So you can already see these reverse innovations coming along and changing the cost of healthcare. There's a company out of China that makes the monitors what were they called? Can you remember? There's a Chinese company they've just listed on the American Stock Exchange. Um, um, I forget their names, but they've decreased the price of monitoring equipment drastically um, by providing exactly the same products to American standards, FDA approved, for a quarter of the cost. So you can already see that this reverse innovation is happening, and I think that Africa is poised to continue this trend. Thank you. Yes, there's, it's, it's amazing the social entrepreneurship that's really... Okay, I've just read that Mind Ray. ...that's invaded. Healthcare is really exciting. I mean, there are new products. There's a new point-of-care device. It was always difficult to do blood work. Say, if you were in Kinshasa, that they had labs in Congo, but if you're in, in the jungle and there's an Ebola outbreak, it might not even get to the health centers for days or weeks, but now with these new point of care devices where you take the lab to the actual place, you can do a diagnosis right away. So there's all kinds of innovation that's going on you know, throughout, throughout Africa to improve health, and it's coming out of the necessity, which is really um, where you know, that is the mother of invention. So um, for you, Neo, how did this film bring home to you? I mean, you work with partners in health so you can speak to that, but what is it, um, what did you see in this film that, that struck you as um, the message that you want people to really take, what you want this audience to take home with them? Sure. 
Thank you, Neil, and thank you, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and be part of this conversation and this wonderful conference. And thank you, Corey, for the film, um, which is really showcases some of the patients that we see in the work in Rwanda, but also really um, tell stories that inspire and increase the resources needed to really deliver this care. Um, so for me, one of the reactions that I had when I saw the film um, was that rheumatic heart disease symbolizes and serves as a metaphor for many of the aspects of non-communicable diseases um, uh, in resource-limited settings. Rheumatic heart disease is a disease that um, has disparities when you look at outcomes between resource-poor and resource-rich countries. You saw the statistic at the beginning of the film where 13 million children have rheumatic heart disease, but the prevalence in the U.S. is almost zero. And we know what the prevention is. We know what the treatment for established cases are. The gap and the challenge is how to deliver those services. So it's not a failure of medical knowledge. It's actually a gap in delivery of, of, the, of the services that are needed. Um, so that's one. The other, um, other um, thing to note about rheumatic heart disease that's relevant to other non-communicable diseases is that the risk factors and the, the contributors to non-communicable diseases vary to some extent in resource-rich versus resource-poor countries. So rheumatic heart disease is the leading cause of heart failure in patients we see in Rwanda and Botswana and other resource-limited countries. Um, whereas when you think of heart failure more, more globally, and particularly in the Western world, you think about coronary heart disease and you think of risk factors of obesity, smoking, et cetera. So I think that recognizing that the risk factors vary to some extent for some conditions, you know, some cancers, for example, is an example, um, really um, uh, challenges us to think about interventions that may need to be adapted um, and that are different from the, the <coughs> developing world context. Um, and some of those applications and adaptations may be relevant to reverse, um, reverse innovation that, that you've mentioned, Ola. Um, the last thing is that rheumatic heart disease is a complex condition, medical condition in terms of treatment of it. So it's not, you know, we often compare chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases with HIV. It's complex in the sense that the treatment is not just medications, there's surgical interventions that are needed. And the post-surgical um, care is also something that's qu quite complex that requires a mix of skill sets. Um, I think that a, f a film like Open Heart highlights the complexity, but it also, with the follow-up of the stories of the patients in the film, is inspiring because you really do see that with um, task shifting and other innovations, with partnerships, um, with NGOs like Partners in Health, and strong leadership and ownership of Ministry of Health of Rwanda, that care can be provided. Um, and a lot of naysayers who say the care is too complex to be um, safely and effectively delivered in resource-poor settings, this is proof of concept that it actually does work and can be done and can be extended to many other conditions. So for me, that's really the reaction that I get out of the film. Now, specific to the work that, that I do, that we do in, in Rwanda, Partners in Health um, has been working in Rwanda since 2005 at the invitation of the Ministry of Health to really help uh, expand access to health services in the rural setting. 80% of Rwanda's population is the rural poor. And you can imagine there are many, many barriers to accessing health services um, among that population. So Partners in Health, based on its experience in other countries, was invited to come and help and partner with the Ministry of Health. Um, since 2005, Partners in Health has accompanied the work in Rwanda and really responded and evolved in terms of its role to the priorities of the government. And NCDs currently are one of the priorities of the Ministry of Health and specifically rheumatic heart disease and eradication of it um, is something that's highly prioritized. So relevant to the film, um, I, as Director of Non-Communicable non Diseases, I manage the program that delivers services for rheumatic heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, cancers, and asthma across three districts in Rwanda. And these districts cover a catchment of 800,000 patients, all, most of them rural poor. 
um, and the care is delivered at facilities that are public facilities. Most of the staff are run the Ministry of Health employed staff with partners in health providing technical support, systems uh, strengthening supports as well. Um, the model that we use for delivery of these services is really one that I would highlight as longitudinal, meaning that patients come and are followed over the course of time. Um, and we also have nurses leading the care because Rwanda doesn't have enough doctors and specialist doctors and cardiologists. Emmanuel Rusengiza, who's on the film, is one of two pediatric cardiologists in the country, and he's the only one that's serving in the public sector. And this is a, for a population of 11 million. So does this mean that we don't deliver any cardiology um, care because there's not enough cardiologists? No, I think that then you, it forces you to think creatively and really think about how you can rearrange roles and provide training and, and structured supports like protocols to help deliver care. So through three district hospitals um, that uh, we have NCD programs where nurses lead the care, we do work um, with Emmanuel Rusengiza, who visits each of the district hospitals once a month to provide cardiologist-level care and um, provide mentorship to the staff. Another uh, thing that we recognize as pretty significant in being able to deliver services to patients is social barriers to care. So many of our patients can't necessarily afford transport to come and make the long trip across um, Rwanda walking or by bus um, to actually receive services. Um, when patients are admitted, some patients can't afford food and, and malnutrition, uh, particularly among the pediatric population, significantly impacts recovery um, from disease. So because of that, we really have as a key part of the package of services we deliver, socioeconomic supports in the form of transport vouchers, food, and for a select number of patients limited by funding, um, we have income generating um, um, projects um, that we enroll patients into so that really, really, after recovery from their conditions, they can also um, be economically independent um, for themselves and for their families. So um, that's how I describe the program that we, that we currently, that I oversee that delivers services for patients like many of the ones featured in the film. Um, the last thing I would mention is that, you know, for rheumatic heart disease in particular, the surgery is not the end all and be all of, of the treatment. There's a lot that happens after the surgery and some of it was described in the film. So anticoagulation where the blood is thinned and you need to monitor patients very closely because if you thin the blood too much, they develop stroke or life-threatening bleeds. If you don't thin it enough, the heart clo clots, the clogs up and the patient dies. So even the post-op care for patients is high risk and requires a system, a health system and an infrastructure that can really serve as a home for the patients. So I think that having um, programs, non-communicable disease programs like the ones we have at the district hospitals we support is important for really being able to provide the follow-up care but also providing the basis for long-term follow-up for these patients for family planning. Many of the women, one of the girls was mentioning how girl, boys will go crazy <laughs> over him, but you know, 10 years down the line she's going to be interested in getting married and getting pregnant. And, you have to manage those life decisions the same way a primary care doctor or primary care clinician would manage a patient over the long term. And um, these, these programs serve as a home and, and a forum for that. Um, so I, I'll leave it at that in terms of the work that I do connected to the film. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let me just ask the three of you one last quick question, then we'll open it for any questions you might have, which is, so you, so the audience has seen this film. I'm sure that people have asked you this, Corey, um, before when they've seen the film. But the film is very inspiring, and we want to know what we can do in addition to donating to Partners in Health. So what do you say to Americans who see this film? Um, what kind of action steps can one take when they're so far away from this problem, and yet they feel moved? which I'm sure many of you are moved by, I'm sure you all were moved, but maybe a few of you want to do something, which is what's so powerful about films. So what can, what, what, do, you, what do you suggest? Well, you said beyond donating to partners in health. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Of course, of course that's, <laughs> always the, that question. That's, always the, that's always the primary point. But there's more than, donating is really important, of course, but there's more too, like? 
Yeah, I am the worst with this, you guys, because the truth is, is I go so deep into like, we need structural violence and we need system reform, and we need aid reform and we need all kinds of things. So we do have a, a web, you know, we have a website, openheartfilm.com. And on there, we do have our, you know, how to, how to make an impact. And we've got sort of a menu of things that you can go into, everything from going and supporting emergency. And if you're, a, you know, a clinician, you can actually volunteer with emergency to, work, you know, supporting partners in health. And then we also direct people to, um, to partners in health for some, uh, there are uh, kind of petitions that you can sign on to that are about, that are about reform, about, uh, a, particularly here in the U.S. So speaking to a U.S. audience, it's, uh, a lot of it is about aid reform. I mean, one thing that I, love that it, I think ultimately helps in, you know, help solve an underlying problem is in aid reform. I think that, um, that the government of Rwanda, in, in Skoll giving a grant directly to the government of Rwanda, as opposed to an organization, you know, working in Rwanda, it's, they're able to use it very effectively. They're a very effective government. So, um, <coughs> there are, See, I get into this. Go to our website, openheartfilm.com. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to go off on a whole thing. So, sorry. It's important that there are many things. You, were, you just mentioned a plethora of things from signing petitions to really understanding about aid more, probably getting screenings of the film, which I'm sure is available, so that different groups mm -hmm. from church groups, community groups, to understand this issue that there's a preventable disease that children shouldn't suffer from, 13 million, and that there is something we can do besides throw up our hands and say, wow, that's a lot of kids and that's so far away. Absolutely, and you know, it's, it's interesting because this comes up a lot when I speak at, um, it, you know, at conferences, especially around storytelling and filmmaking, and, and there is this whole thing about who are you making this film for? And a lot of people automatically assume you want to have the widest possible audience. And that's the debate, you know, that we always have in our, in our circle about is it the widest audience or is it that audience of two, you know, that are there two really important people that need to see your film? Is it the health minister of Rwanda and Jeff Skoll? That was very helpful. It was, you know, the President Bashir. And I do think that on, um, I think that there is a place for wide impact. The film was, you know, an Academy nominated film. A lot of people saw it. It screened at pediatric cardiology conferences. It's inspired a lot of things beyond just work in Rwanda and work, work in Sudan. So I do think that I tend to be the person of like, what impact do we want to have and then who needs to see the film to make that impact? But yes, there's- and Inspiring the conversation is important because if you're, as I said at the beginning, if you don't know, then you can't talk about it and right. you can't do anything at all. And so it is the stepping stone to being aware and then sharing that knowledge because it may strike someone as their passion project. And, you, and that's how I sort of think about it, like I won't hit everybody, it's kind of a snowball effect, but when that snowball hits you, if they all miss you, you're fine, but that one that hits you stings. And so this film will sting a few people in ways that it will move all of us, but it might sting some of us because maybe we had a child with heart, with some kind of congestive heart problem. We or had a lot of people who saw this film who uh, were older, in their 70s in the U.S., who had rheumatic heart disease when they were kids and contacted us and said, I want to donate. The surgery is $2,500 per kid. It's actually fairly cost effective in, the, you know, they do, emergency does have the cost down. And we had, uh, we started a campaign called the 52 Hearts Campaign. Um, the, the list at the time in Rwanda the, of kids that needed to have a, a valve replacement, it was 60 kids and only eight could go. So in honor of the 52 kids that were left behind, we, um, we created the 52 Hearts Campaign and one of the very first things we did was raise uh, enough money for you know $2,500 each for 52 kids to have surgery at Salam Center in Sudan. Uh, not, it wasn't necessarily the same 52 kids, but in, in honor of, of the 52. And we did get a list of names of the kids that had the surgery. And that, that's really a critical story about people who really could relate in the United States and had the means to support those kids. So that's another example of how this film really can, can, 
can strike people, and those snowballs did sting them. You can't, and, and for me, I do get frustrated because I think, yes, we need innovations, but it needs to get cheaper. One of my favorite things about, uh, I was driving up to LA for a screening of the film, and I was questioning, what am I doing with my life? What, you know, <laughs> like, huh, I need to, you know, I can't pay my bills, and I'm LA like, does that too. It does, yeah. and I'm just like, God, is this the right thing? And I am on the 405, and I look over, and there's a car, and the license plate says heart valve, the license plate. Hmm. And I burst into tears, and I pull it next to the guy, and I roll my window down, and I'm like, I like your license plate. And he's like, <laughs> I'm like and I'm crying. I'm like, I like your license plate. And he rolls his window down, and we're actually at the border between San Diego and LA, where there's a you have to stop uh, for immigration. And so I'm yelling across the freeway to him, like I made a film about heart valves, and I'm crying. And and he calls out, you know, I make heart valves. He's a heart valve designer. <laughs> oh wow! And so yeah, and I got him the film, and I'm like, can you bring the cost <laughs> of these things down? You know, I mean, it's like that's. So it is like, yeah, impact, audience of one, you know, a guy I met on the freeway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yes. What would it take? Say your name and where you're from. I can be loud. I'm with ARP. Uh, I'm with ARP. What would it take, in terms of resources and whatever else, to actually, you know, prevent this? All 13 million cases that come up. That's the first question. Second is, you said $2,500 um, for each child to, to undergo the procedure and the complicated route. For that same amount of money, how many cases could be prevented? And is that moral question something we should even be asking? Um, yeah. So I'll take a first <laughs> crack at that. Um, so very good questions. Um, and maybe I'll start with answering the second question. I, I don't think that we should necessarily dichotomize the options and say if we have a pot of 2,500, it's either towards prevention versus towards the surgery treatment. Um, I think that... Um, efforts to, towards addressing prevention and treatment need to happen. One, because prevention ultimately is what will um, help eradicate the disease, but two, there are many, many patients and children, 13 million of them who already have the disease established. What do you do for them? Do you just let them die or do you let them give, give them a chance in terms of having a longer life and Im improved mor morbidity? So that, that's my short answer to the question. In terms of what it would take, I, I don't know that I have a dollar amount, but I can describe to you some of the programmatic uh, steps and interventions, many of which are happening in Rwanda at the moment, that will help with regards to prevention as well as treatment. So treatment, I've already talked about what's available at the district level at PIH-supported sites. Um, we are actually working, the other hat that I wear is I'm seconded to the Ministry of Health as advisor on NCDs because the Ministry of Health is really looking to scale up NCD programs at all 42 district hospitals in the country. And so we're at the point where a strategic plan is being built and actually trainings of trainers are starting um, for clinicians who would provide these services. The Skoll um, Award that Corey has mentioned contributes to this training. Um, within the 500,000, um, there is money that will train one doctor and one nurse um, at each district hospital to really be able to diagnose and manage at the district hospital level uh, patients with rheumatic heart disease. Um, and also provide post-op post care. Um, it's not just at the district, so that would happen nationally, but then the other thing that Ministry of Health of Rwanda is doing is actually decentralizing to the health center level, which is the primary care level, as well as the community level. I don't know if many of you know, but Rwanda has a 45,000 strong community health worker uh, force. Um, which is contributing to many interventions in health, including maternal child health, including HIV, prevention and sensitization, but also follow-up of patients with 
uh, chronic diseases, including non-communicable diseases. So um, the NCD services will be decentralized at the level of the community health um, level. And one of the things that we are discussing for prevention of rheumatic heart disease is training and implementing pen penicillin for treatment of strep pharyngitis and also for secondary prevention towards rheumatic heart disease. Um, so that's something that's definitely in the works and would significantly improve um, the numbers that we see with rheumatic heart disease. And it can happen relatively cheaply with the integrated task shifted approach that um, is being considered because um, at the health center level, the person who's actually, the clinician who's delivering that care is a nurse who's received one to two years post high school of nursing training and then in-service training in NCDs. And their salary, if, if I could say it, um, is about $6,000, $7,000 per year. And they're not just providing services for this intervention, but for a whole uh, group of chronic diseases. Um, in terms of diagnostics and, and medical equipment, I think uh, Ola has already um, touched on some of the the potential there. Um, we use point of care testing uh, for, uh, for diabetes is a good example. We use hemoglobin A1C point of care testing, the price of which has gone down even in the three years that I've been in this role. And there's increasingly um, more and more interest and activity in that arena to really um, cheapen the, the, the cost of, of equipment that will be needed that could potentially be decentralized to the health center level as well. Um, so th that's how I would uh, characterize um, interventions that would address both prevention and treatment for these patients, really with an emphasis on integration within the Ministry of Health and the public sector, and also um, task shifting and decentralization to the community level. Within, I want to say within that grant as well, so uh, how many nurses are being trained? Sure. So it's 40, there's 42 district hospitals, so it's 42 nurses and 42 general practitioner doctors that are being trained. And additionally, um, staff at the district hospital level who are responsible for data entry and data management are going to be trained specifically on tracking indicators for NCDs so that we could really see baseline and also impact um, of the interventions. The other thing that the grant um, allows is for um, completion of a, pre a prevalent study that's underway that looks, that uses echo screening to look at the prevalence of rheumatic heart disease in the population uh, in Rwanda. And um, the thought is that that's a baseline measure 10 years from now that could be repeated to see uh, what the impact of the interventions might be. Um, one other thing I'd, I'd like to mention, um, which is related to sort of funding, giving to PIAGS, but also giving to uh, Rwanda and other governments that are doing great work. Um, I'd like uh, to just share an example of what Rwanda Ministry of Health has done in terms of redefining aid, but also putting to good use uh, money um, that has been donated. So Rwanda has, uh, since 2011, embarked on a seven-year program called Human Resources for Health, which is really a repurposing of U.S. government funding um, via USAID and PEPFA to invest in medical education. So I think Rwanda has done a lot in terms of short-term and creative ways to address urgent issues like rheumatic heart disease, like breast cancer, cervical cancer, but thinking in the long term, um, there is a bit, huge need to expand the number of specialists, doctors, nurses, and even um, <coughs> areas that are not clinical but are critical to the delivery of health services, such as hospital management. So with um, the estimated 132 million over seven years divested from um, U.S. government funding, they have set up uh, a partnership with 16 U.S. medical institutions and to have faculty members, over 100 faculty members come to Rwanda every year to serve as trainers and mentors to uh, doctors in residency training, nurses in postgraduate training, to train in all the specialty and subspecialty fields that are relevant to the diseases that are seen in Rwanda. The result of this will be that seven years down the line, there'll be double the number of doctors. Right now, the 600 is gonna double to 1,200. Um, there'll be a, a cohort of specialists and subspecialists. Um, nurses are gonna be upgraded in terms of their credentials um, by 50%, and the number of nurses will increase by 50% as well. 
And ultimately, you will have a generation of um, medical personnel who can serve as trainers for future generations. Mm -hmm. And so that really provides an independence of Rwanda from um, other institutions outside of the country to really continue to build the capacity for, for healthcare delivery in country. I also think it speaks to this, this amount of money um, goes directly to the US, uh, to the Rwanda government. So it's also unprecedented and it also has um, redefined the way that we think of aid in that it goes directly to the government. The government prioritizes what it wants to do with the aid and saves a lot in terms of overhead and other considerations. So it's really a proud and, uh, and formidable um, achievement that Rwanda has been able to embark on. And I think many countries um, with similar challenges can look to it um, and apply a similar approach. And, and they have plans to be off of a, you know, to to be off of it, right, by 2018. 2018. Yeah. So it's, I think the question that you pose is really a critical question about dichotomizing, as Neil was saying, these issues. You know, more children die of diarrheal diseases in Africa than from HIV AIDS. So does that mean that we should yeah. just put all the money into diarrheal diseases to treat them and not worry so much about the other because fewer kids die? And the answer is, I don't think morally, Yes, the answer is no, we have to do both. So how do we do both? So then we start thinking about innovative financing, for instance. And so in, in Europe, every airline ticket is taxed and that money goes to what's an uh, or organization, a nonprofit called Unitaid, where 80% of the children in Africa who have HIV, AIDS, get their antiretrovirals through this program that is paid for by a tax on airline tickets from one to two euros up to 20 euros, depending on the class, automatically on all European flights. Both the um, Bush and Obama administrations have said no to those taxes in the United States. Those taxes have raised over, I think, two billion dollars that have gone to provide ARVs in Africa because ARVs are um, expensive drugs. So this innovative financing approach is you know, something that came up out of necessity as a way to pay for instead of dichotomize the issue and say, well, we just can't afford that because not as many kids have this or as that, but that we target various kinds of problems and we find innovative ways, and I think you sort of did mention like taxes, and that's one, that really, you know, if you take an airline flight, it's not going to hurt you to pay $2 more or $1 more on your seat, but that money is going to have a huge impact, as it already has, on the lives of, of, of uh, people in Africa and getting ARVs at, um, at cost. So um, there are many ways that we, in the United States, because we haven't faced that, um, but in other parts of the world are dealing with innovatively to pay for the, <coughs> the costs, um, that um, you know, we don't we don't have to deal with here, fortunately. But but it's something that we should be thinking about and supporting because we don't do that in the United States. Do we have time for any more questions? One more, One more question. Sure. Any other? Yes. In one sentence, Corey, Ola, Neo, I'd love to hear what next film you wish for. <laughs> What's the next what film you would want to see? The All next. three of you. Well, you the want next. your, what would want you, your what film. What film would you want made? The, the next, what the, film. the next film. film. Uh, the film I'm working on now and have been working on for four years, Bend the Ark, which really talks about how the world is different as a result of these incredible heroes of global health. Um, there's a program on CNBC, it's called Game Changers, and it's usually profiling like the founders of Facebook and Twitter and you know all the big Walmart, all the big American conglomerates that have not only, um, not only do business in America but do business um, multinationally. Um, and I think that We've talked about the right now plans. The right now plan is to get donors, to get aid, you know, to get whatever we can, wherever we can, tax foreign airline tickets to fix our problems in Africa. But that is a right now plan. That is not a long term plan. The long term issue is that Africa is poor and we need to get rich to be able to fund our own health care. Do you know what I mean? Like, we can't be taxing 
foreign airline tickets for the rest of our life. What about what, what we're producing in Africa? I think for decades, Africa has been this place that we produce what we don't consume and consume what we don't produce. I know people that have been co producing cocoa for the past 20 years and have never seen chocolate. We need to start adding value. And if I could even say what I would love for um, Americans to set up is a, a system where we can actually be encouraged to become entrepreneurs. How was America built? It was built through entrepreneurship. It was not built through government, and it was definitely not built through aid. And Africa is going to be built up by trade. We need to actually become wealthy. We need to start adding value. And um, this, so the film that I would like to see is Game Changers. But game changers, African multi-billionaire entrepreneurs that have built universities, that have contributed and put their names on I, our version of our Ivy League universities in Africa that, de that, are, de um, that are developing world-class research from Africa, exporting to the world, that are developing world-class academic studies, and you know, are leading the world, that are thought leaders and business leaders. So that's a movie that I would like to see. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I don't know that I could word it as eloquently as Ola has said, but I think a film that really highlights um, um, resources that are ingrown um, in African countries that could be um, learned from and applied to um, developed countries. So a film that really highlights reverse innovation, of which there are many examples, but it really hasn't... Um, I don't think that the, the examples have risen to the level of dialogue and broad media, such as open heart, as we'd like to see happen. Um, so maybe that would be a film that work. Well, thank you. By the way, um, African airlines do tax for, for the yeah. ARVs as well, just <laughs> not in America. So um, uh, thank you all, the three of you. Thank you thank so you. much, Corey, you. for your film. Thank you, Ola, for what you're doing with air ambulances. Thank you, Nao, for what you're doing, rheumatic heart disease and working with partners in health. And thank you all for coming, and thank you, Peggy, for having us. It's been really our pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.